coming up tonight. The weather plays some games. We meet the captain, and we journey back down the rabbit hole to visit Spectra again. It's all coming up, so let's set sail. <laughs> Welcome to day two of the cruise we've on board the Anthem of the Seas. I am of course Derek Cone, and today was May 4th, 2018. And our top stories for today, just one from yesterday that I forgot to mention. I did once again purchase the Wild Band, something I've done on all my recent sailings. They've been doing an exchange program on this sailing. They did not offer that. If you wanted a Wild Band, it was $4.99. There was no offer to just turn in or have, as we saw last year, your existing wild band reprogrammed for the new sailing. So instead it was $4.99, whether it was your first wild band or you wanted to replace it, you were still forced to buy that brand new one for $4.99. And so far, they've been working just like we saw last year. They've been working well, getting into the cabin easily, being able to get into shows, make purchases, everything you'd expect to use your card for so far has worked with the WoW band, so no issues up to this point, which is good. Of course, we know Harmony and Quantum both had their issues, but this is now two for two for Anthem on having working WoW bands. And so our location today, of course, it was a sea day, the first sea day of the sailing. Our noontime location was 36 degrees and 12 minutes north by 68 degrees and 46 minutes west. We're traveling at a speed of 18 knots, according to the captain, but from what I saw on all the TVs, we're actually doing 20 and a half knots at the time. So we made a pretty good pace to get to Bermuda on time. We are, of course, next headed to Bermuda, which was 320 miles away at the time of the noon announcements. And for tomorrow, we are expected to arrive there at 6 a.m. to start our entry, and it's gonna take two hours, but it's finally making a docking at 8 a.m. As for the weather, Yesterday I mentioned the weather really was kind of all over the place and today was a bit more of that, a lot more wacky weather. We had a sunrise at 6.44 a.m. this morning and with it was high winds. Deck 15 was actually closed this morning because of those winds. It was really cloudy, kind of dreary in the morning. We had 9 a.m. I fly and we had trouble getting to that because the top deck of course was closed, which is the area you have to pass through in order to get to the sports area. But as the day went on, those conditions very rapidly improved. By probably about 10 a.m., it was much nicer. We had some sunny conditions. We actually got into the low 70s today. This morning, we had six to seven foot seas, and by tonight, they're down to three to four foot. And this morning's winds were 30 knots, while tonight they are significantly lower. So overall, just a very nice afternoon and evening tonight compared to the conditions we saw when we woke up this morning. So the day at sea, what was going on on board the Anthem of the Seas? Of course, looking at the compass, for me at least it started this morning at 9 a.m. as I mentioned with that iFly session with that bad weather. Originally it was possibly going to be canceled but everything cleared up in time to get out there and it was a very small session. Of course I've done the iFly several times on Quantum and once last year on the Anthem of the Seas. This is the first time that I've had a session that was that small. It was only maybe six people, which is about half the size of a normal session. And part of that could have been the weather. There was some misinformation that we were given about the decks being closed. And when we actually went out, there were still lists being closed, but certain doors were open and they were operating at that time. So that might have been the cause of it. But later in the day when I did go check out the iFly, there was a bit of a backlog of groups. So that might have been making up some of those people that missed their sessions. But as for my individual session, of course, went very similar to the other ones. If you've never done iFly, of course, go through a class first, basically an instructional video giving you some key tips on how to succeed at the iFly the best that you can followed by getting suited up and heading up to the wind tunnel where you get to actually do your one minute within the air.
following that. This morning at 10 a.m. over in the music hall was then the cruise critic meet and mingle. We had 127 people this time, so a much smaller group than the Harmony of Seas Transatlantic. And I believe smaller than last year's anthem sailing as well. Clo, of course, stopped by, gave a little talk about the Anthem of the Seas and sailing out of Bayonne, a little history of herself at, and her life at sea. And then, of course, there was a raffle held to give away some prizes, as there often is at these meet and mingles. This afternoon, we then had a doubleheader at 2.30. At 2.30 and 2.70, an event that I absolutely loved on the Independence Seas and have not seen repeated since then, the Royal Caribbean Story Part 1 was shown in 270 today, and that is an event, if you ever see it on your compass, if you like Royal Caribbean, if you like cruising in general, you must attend it. It is very interesting, a lot of inside information about how this company got started, how the ships got to be, things like this. How all this came to be at, for a little cruise line starting with a single small ship to this mega company that we have today. And that was only part one, that only goes to, I believe, the Voyager class. And hopefully there'll be a part two. Last I heard of it was six years ago on the Independence of the Season back then, they were talking about making part two, so hopefully by now they've gotten that done. But I unfortunately did not attend that because 2.30 was also the exact same time for the afternoon matinee of We Will Rock You. Of course, the World Korean production show for the Anthem of the Seas, their Broadway production. And this is the one show from the anthem that I did not get to see last year, so I had to make sure that I got to see it today, as well as tomorrow when I actually have a reservation. So I'm not going to go into too much of it today, because I will talk more tomorrow when it is the official evening show. But just seeing it today once, it was absolutely incredible. Easily one of the top World Caribbean shows, possibly the best Broadway show topping Mamma Mia. But that was about two hours from 2.30 to 4.30, and then, of course, got ready for dinner. And at 5.30 tonight was dinner. Day two always means the formal night, the captain's night, and that was no exception. And unfortunately, as I say every time, the menu is not the greatest on this day either. But I did find a couple things tonight. I started with a French onion soup, followed by a dish I've never had before. It was listed as a vegetable casserole. It was Definitely within the Indian family of food and very similar to some of the food I had in the past on board the Independence Seas where they, of course, with that British menu system, had an Indian dish every day. And that was a very delicious dish. It was listed as vegetarian, but it wasn't over the top with vegetables. It was basically a grain dish with some potatoes and a very spicy, flavorful sauce on it. And then for my dessert, I went with a classic one, the apple pie a la mode. Immediately following dinner then was right to here, to this exact spot, the Royal Esplanada for the captain's moment, where Captain Henrik Lof Sorensen came out, introduced all the different officers of the Anthem of the Seas. They all stood in the stairs, everyone get their pictures, and hear all the names of the officers that are on board the ship. He did not go into very much detail on the sailing, unfortunately, no real statistics. The only number he actually threw out was the number of crew, which is 1,660 crew members during the sailing. There were no numbers on the guests, but I'll try to see if I can get that before the end of the sailing, because that is one of those statistics that I've been tracking through each sailing we've done so far. And then that was, of course, 7.15, lasted about 15 minutes till just before 7.30 it was done, and that left a little bit of a gap to see the sunset tonight before heading to 270 for Spectra's Cabaret, my reservation show. And as I often say, when you're going to a 270 show, the best place to be is right up front. Right in that front row, right on the stage, right next to the cast members, everything right in your face, and that was no exception today. That is, of course, where I went to, and it was just as good as it always is in 270. You've got all the action right in front of you, nothing to miss there. And if you do get a chance, always be sure to see it multiple times because this is a very different show from the back where you can see the full size and scale of the show versus when you're up close and it really kind of becomes this incredibly immersive experience.
compared to last year, it was pretty on par. It even had the exact same spectra that we saw last April on the Anthem of the Seas. But I did notice that it seemed like there were a couple cast members missing. I believe we're nearing the end of the 270 cast rotation. I know the Royal Theatre is in their very last sailing, but I believe 270 is within a month of the end, so at this point in a contract, there may be various people that have had to leave for different reasons, so that's likely why it appeared to be a slightly smaller cast than we've seen last year. And then following Spectre was a very easy transition, as just 15 minutes after Spectre ended, right into 70 once again was the adult comedy show with Steve White. Just like last night, absolutely hilarious. Really not even in the Royal Caribbean style of comedy shows. It did not have that old, stale, dry format to it. It was just off the cuff, hilarious comedy from start to finish, continuously interacting with the crowd. And it was the absolute perfect show to have in 270 with the audience just surrounding him 180 degrees, able to move around and easily interact with the entire audience. It was just the per perfect venue for the perfect style show. And that was, of course, a great show. Shadow comedy meant that it was not kid friendly and it certainly had a lot of language but as I've mentioned in the past, adult only doesn't mean it has to be crude. It did go into some very dirty areas but it did not feel over the top or forced as it sometimes can be. It was just the perfect balance of adult humor. So that about wrapped it up for the night. It was That lasted about 45 minutes till about 12.15, 12.30 and then beyond there there are not many people around but there are a couple things happening in music hall right now. But as I mentioned tonight, the big event of course was the captain's moment being captain's night. And for interview tonight, I got to sit down with the captain himself, Captain Henrik Lof Sorensen, to discuss how he got on board the Anthem of the Seas and a little bit of his history. Welcome on board the Anthem of the Seas. And uh, I'm glad to see so many of you here. It's amazing how many people you can get together when you provide some free booze. Did you notice that? <laughs> Today I am once again on the bridge, this time joined by Captain Henrik Sorensen. How are you? Thank Welcome you. to the bridge. Thank you. Okay. So what got you interested in being at sea? Uh, at the very first, back in the days when I started, uh, well, uh, it was a bit of a coincidence really. Um, none in, uh, nobody in my family ever went to sea. Uh, I come from a farmer family and uh, in a small society, small community. And uh, then um, some guy from Merskline came uh, and did a seminar at uh, grade school. Uh, we have a little bit of different uh, schooling system in, in Scandinavia. Uh, so that's uh, your 10th grade is, is the average age of like 14, 15. And he made it sound like if you want to see the world, you should go to sea. So he, he failed to mention that the seawater looks the same all <laughs> over the world. But uh, that's how I got into it initially with Merskline. Uh, as a cadet uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you end up connecting with Royal Caribbean? Uh, yeah, after uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't know anything about cruise lines. It wasn't a familiar uh, industry to us. It was, uh, and, and uh, Den uh, Denmark really don't have cruise lines as such. So it was cargo ships, it was container ships, it was tankers. Uh, and uh, after that, I, I only spent a short period of time on, on uh, the commercial ships, and then I went uh, to join the Navy uh, in Denmark and, um, and spent some time there in the Coast Guard. So after that, I was in a transition period where I worked on ferries, local ferries, car ferries. And I met uh, a colleague there that uh, used to work for uh, on board a cruise ship called Royal Viking Sun at the time. It was a Cunard line. And he invited uh, uh, me for a visit uh, while the, his old ship was visit, visiting in Copenhagen and I got all excited about cruise ships and then I applied for several different cruise lines and uh, I was accepted with the Royal Caribbean and that's how it started. Yeah. So uh, in the past one of your roles was as an IT manager. What was that experience like? Um, it was, uh, again, during the transition period, I wanted to do something more uh, than um, or, or, or sort of broaden the horizon, the skill set a bit. So uh, that was between two, financial and, and IT. So I did uh, uh, mostly self-taught and courses. Um, and um, 
my uh, IT manager role at the time, which was with the ferry company, those were exciting times because we were building new ships and then we had to design booking systems, uh, ticketing systems, uh, payment option systems, and we were renewing, uh, we had to renew all our hardware and yeah. software. And then I, uh, I got to work very closely with contractors on this and then I became sort of the only one who knew how that was built and then I, all of a sudden I was an IT manager res yeah. responsible for that. So that was a great experience and I have uh, used that a lot throughout the years, the, which was uh, initially more a passion than it was a, a skill set and then I combined the, the two. Yeah. So you are now the captain of the most high-tech cruise ship at sea. <laughs> so what kinds of special challenges or benefits do you get from such a high-tech ship? Um, well, the, the thing uh, with technology comes um, uh, skilled operators. So we can say the skill set from uh, required from uh, bridge officers, navigation officers, uh, in particular from engineers, uh, and throughout the organization also in various areas in the hotel, uh, requires more technically skilled uh, and technically trained staff and officers. So that's uh, what sets it aside a, a bit from, let's say, more conventional or less high-tech cruise ships, uh, that it, uh, you have a lot of equipment that can help you, uh, that it can assist you, and, and makes everything very smart and efficient. So then it becomes more a matter of understanding where the information comes from so you can interpret uh, and find any potential errors, mistakes, and so on. So that's the difference, more, more technically skilled and technically trained crew to operate a, a more technical and sophisticated yeah. ship. So the original Quantum of the Seas is no longer here because she could not make it to Bermuda, but the Anthem is now able to with their extra dredging and widening. What kinds of challenges do you have when making that passage to Bermuda? Uh, well, it is a, a big ship. Uh, to bring in and out of Bermuda and the quantum was it was prepared for the the quantum however uh, as you probably were they didn't manage to finish in time and then we got the owner of that uh, the the port interface itself inside uh, Kings uh, and the Heritage Wharf area it doesn't really constitute a challenge uh, the, the bigger challenge are the narrow waterways that we have to transit to get in there um, but they have widened and they have done some dredging, which uh, makes it, uh, it, as long as you uh, um, have solid navigation procedures and uh, are very uh, alert and attentive, um, under normal weather conditions, it doesn't uh, constitute a bigger risk than other ports. Okay. Then, moving on to some of the things that you do on this ship itself, all of your announcements have a special little twist to them. You do little <laughs> songs with every announcement. How did you get started with that? Um, uh, good point. If only I could remember. I think, um, <laughs> I think each uh, uh, captain sort of develops uh, their own style. Um, and so you see and you hear from others and some sort of take on. Uh, but I think you want to find your own sort of little unique style. And Initially, it came about. Um, I was on uh, my first assignment was the Brilliance of the Seas, and we were deployed worldwide, more or less. Uh, we were deployed in the in the Middle East, out of Dubai, Europe, and there was a lots of times where I needed to get uh, information across uh, in in terms of either the the port or the transit. That if I didn't really get it across, then everybody, all the guests, would come and ask. So. Uh, I, feel, I was thinking, how can I get people's attention? And I sort of came up with, if I play a little jingle, uh, then everybody stops and listen, and then I have their attention, and then it just sort of carried on from there. <laughs> yeah. So you are one of two captains for Anthem Seas. You share the studio with Shrek Ovan, That's who right. we talked to last year as well. And what is it like, how do you split those duties with the transitioning between two captains? Um, well, basically, um, you sort of, um, when you are two uh, captains, you sort of share the ship 50-50 or, or equally because we, of our contracts, we, we work an equal amount of time. Uh, it's important to um, uh, be aligned uh, in terms of the overall operation, so uh, it doesn't have to adjust to, right. to one person. So, 
If there are certain things we don't uh, agree on, uh, which is very rare, actually we, we work very well together and we also shared the quantum before that, so that is uh, uh, very comfortable and we've been uh, replacing each other for years, uh, so we know each other very well. Uh, and uh, so uh, if, if there is something that we don't quite agree on, then we, we discuss amongst ourselves and then we, we compromise if we have to. And do you have any future plans at the moment? Um, future plans? I think that when you, uh, your career is always, always the next position and then you end up in this position and sort of the end position on the ships. Um, I don't, at, at the current I don't have a, a bigger goal in terms of uh, moving uh, elsewhere in the organization, but that may change. Uh, and it is a very interesting, um, well, the industry is in development, very, very interesting um, uh, industry. Uh, it's a brilliant uh, company uh, to be part of. It's very exciting to be part of the innovative thinking, uh, and there are so many exciting opportunities uh, continuously and also on a more global scale. Uh, so I would uh, definitely uh, not be anywhere else in the industry. Uh, in terms of how that looks in the future for myself, uh, we will see. Uh, I'm sure exciting opportunities come up uh, all the time. I also spent a couple of years working for our new building uh, program with the construction of what then was called the Project Genesis and later became the Oasis yeah. in the Seas and our uh, uh, colleagues over in Celebrity Cruises and the construction of the Celebrity Solstice. So, so new build is definitely an interesting area to be in as well and I can't rule out that uh, I might be there in the future, who knows. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell the viewers before we go? Um, I suppose uh, it's always great to have an opportunity to talk a bit about the product. Uh, I think that um, the uh, Crown and Anger Society we have with more than 10 million members sort of speaks for itself and really, uh, so if they are watching, I want to <laughs> thank that group in particular for being our great and loyal ambassadors uh, to the brand and, and really has um, contributed enormously to where we are today uh, and the voice of Royal Caribbean and uh, of course also thank you yourself for um, being part of uh, really voicing, you know, communicating, informing uh, about the experiences and I hope yourself and all our guests here continue to have a, a great experience uh, on board and, um, and the product continue to grow. So. So that's always great to have an opportunity to, to get to say uh, a few things about the brand and about the ship. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you for taking the time. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. So as always, I want to thank the captain for taking the time to talk to me. The captain, of course, is in charge of his entire ship, everything, and everybody on board it. So he's, of course, a very busy person, but it's always nice when he's able to take a little bit of time to sit down and share some information about his past with us. So that about does it for today's episode of the Cruise View. Of course, tomorrow we are in Bermuda, bright and early. In fact, dark and early as we'll be pulling in, as I mentioned, at 6 a.m. before the sun rises with an official dock time at 8 a.m. So be sure to tune in tomorrow to learn a little bit about what went on in Bermuda. And as always, I am Derek Cohn. Stay tuned for the links. <laughs>